Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I am a dental surgeon and also the CEO of this organization. So we have a case presentation today on a traumatic extraction. Now, a traumatic extraction is a bit of a misnomer of a term. Basically, when you're trying to take a tooth out, you have to basically cause a certain amount of trauma in order to get it out. Unless a tooth is severely periodontally involved, the term atraumatic kind of doesn't quite make sense. The more correct term is probably minimally traumatic extraction. And the main purpose of this from the perspective of oral implantology is to minimize the amount of damage that's going to take place uh, to the bone or the residual bony socket. Uh, and also to facilitate uh, the placement of an immediate dental implant. So let's take a look at a case here, and we're going to basically demonstrate some of the principles of a traumatic or minimally traumatic extraction. So we have patient X, who is a 36-year-old healthy female who basically presented to the office, and uh, she's been a patient for a while, and she has a post corcoran complex on the left maxillary central incisor. And the problem with this post corcoran complex is that over time, uh, it has basically become loose. And when we take a radiograph and take a look at this, basically what we find is that she's had basically a root fracture of the tooth and the, uh, the restoration has failed. So upon reviewing the panoral radiograph for this patient in this, in this uh, picture here, you can see that the uh, upper left uh, maxillary central incisor, tooth number 2-1 as per FDI definition, uh, has a uh, root canal treatment. It has a uh, effectively long enough uh, post and it also has a, a, a indirect restoration in the form of a crown. When looking at the periapical radiograph, uh, one can see that the, there is no bone loss uh, or a soft, uh, sorry, no bone loss associated with this tissue or any other issue that one can see. Uh, however, when clinically, there was a fairly significant, uh, fairly, fairly, fairly significant carious lesion and fracture, which was evident. So the treatment plan for this patient basically consists of uh, getting consent from this patient, and in the in the consent process, we basically discuss what basically the diagnosis for this patient is. So this is a failed tooth, which unfortunately is going to require extraction due to a vertical fracture inside the tooth and the fact that the uh, post crown complex is no longer being retained. And we have to talk about options to the, for the patient. So we talk about options like taking the tooth out and doing nothing, uh, taking the tooth out and providing the patient with some sort of a removable prosthetic, uh, uh, providing the patient with the form, some form of a three-unit bridge, or and finally, uh, the option of a dental implant, uh, which would have either a cemented or screw-retained restoration. So the patient basically opted for a treatment plan that would uh, provide her uh, with a dental implant solution. So the next thing would be uh, for an atraumatic extraction and placement of an immediate dental implant into the dense palatal bone if possible, and then finally placement of a bone graft into the uh, gap or jump junction uh, for this particular patient. And in order to sort of cover this whole area up, we're gonna place a platelet-rich fibrin graft on top, and then finally uh, place a transitional prosthesis for this patient. So in this radiograph, you can see that using our implant treatment planning software, uh, we've basically determined that we have about 5 millimeters of width and around 16.1 millimeters of height. Uh, one can also appreciate this radiograph. You can see a bit of the radial lucency in the coronal aspect of the post, uh, basically signifying where this uh, restoration had failed. So in this particular case, we're going to place a uh, MIS uh, 7 5.0 by 13 millimeter implant. And in the video, we're basically going to demonstrate uh, what an atraumatic extraction should look like. So the purpose of this this whole uh, case presentation is just to highlight the uh, actual atraumatic extraction. However, we'll try to go gate to gate and sort of provide uh, as much uh, uh, display of the whole process that sort of took place. So in this video, you can see that I've uh, taken my uh, favorite instrument. This is called a Woodson elevator. And the beauty of the Woodson elevator is uh, three things. Number one, it has a very uh, thin handle. And then the shank and the blade of this instrument are fairly thin or thin enough that it's very easy to sort of get this between the attached gingiva and into the periodontal ligament to sort of just start luxating these teeth uh, to basically re reduce the amount of attachment that this tooth uh, has uh, in the residual socket. And the nice thing about this is sort of just helps, uh, you know, in a sort of progressive manner, uh, help get this tooth out as minimally traumatic as possible. You'll also notice that in this, in this uh, video that I have my index finger and my thumb on the patient's alveolar ridge. This was a technique that I learned from 
one of my instructors in dental school, Dr. Howard Holmes, he was an oral maxillofacial surgeon, who basically told us that you can get a lot of proprioceptive information with respect to the forces that you're applying on the patient just by putting your fingers uh, on that alveolar ridge. So I have my fingers there and sort of giving me uh, some information with respect to uh, how loose this tooth is and when's going to be the right time to sort of take a forcep uh, onto this tooth. You all right? So gently take your time, there's no rush. And what I'm doing now is I'm grabbing in my forcep. I like using a 76S, so made for pedo teeth, but the nice thing about it, it's got a nice uh, thin uh, blade to it. And I'm just going to engage this right here, and once again, feeling that alveolar, alveolar bone. And it's just gently rotating, rotating, and you see here, rotate, rotate, and eventually I'm going to track this, apply some traction to this tooth. And just you're severing the periodontal ligament attachment and trying to not fracture, especially that buccal plate of bone. You want to preserve that buccal plate of bone. And here we go, the tooth's out in an atraumatic manner. And now what I'm doing is basically grabbing a curette, and we're going to go back into the socket here, just curette the socket out, make sure there's no tissue inside there, make sure there's no remnants left over from the endodontic procedure that had taken place. You're also assessing that buccal plate to make sure that it's not fractured, so that you can one can facilitate the placement of an immediate dental implant into that dense, dense, dense buccal bone. So that's the end of the video. And one can see in this photograph here uh, the osteotomy that had taken place using the uh, twist drills to place the dental implant into that dense uh, palatal bone. And we tried to basically maintain a screw retained position for uh, this particular restoration. In this picture here, one can see the nice uh, application of the of the beak of that uh, forcep towards uh, this uh, this particular tooth. That's why I like the 76S. In this picture, one can appreciate uh, that uh, failed uh, uh, post core and crown complex in the tooth. In this picture here, we have a picture of the actual dental implant is placed, uh, one can appreciate that there's a large gap jump junction on that buccal aspect. Uh, many times I choose not to graft in this particular case, I chose to graft uh, the patient. So you have to place the cover screw on. So in this picture you can see that the cover screw has been placed for this patient and in the next photograph you will see that we had placed uh, the cover screw. Oh sorry, the radiograph was the last pi picture, so the radiograph of the actual implant in place, and here's the cover screw. And now you can see the bone graft that's been put into place, and on top of this we basically packed down some platelet-rich fibrin, and this stuff when it goes in, if you have, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't used platelet-rich fibrin before, it truly is amazing. It is, uh, I, I use the term the LCF, the looks cool factor, this stuff is just amazing. It looks really cool. So we put a figure eight uh, silk suture in to help retain this platelet rich fibrin and the patient goes away for about seven days and uh, we'll bring the patient back in seven days time to take the suture away. We'll have some pictures up of this uh, patient uh, uh, at the seven day mark. Uh, you also want to place the uh, prosthesis for this patient. So in this photograph here you can see that I have placed the transitional prosthesis for this patient and you know, from an aesthetic perspective this is uh, absolutely uh, acceptable. Uh, some people talk about having fixed prosthesis. In my own personal experience uh, the problem with the fixed prosthesis is normally you're cementing them down with something temporary and patients are always uh, knocking them off and it just becomes a bit of a nuisance and having to put these things back on. So the removable prostheses work really well. Another one that I like using that helps actually form a nice ovate pontic in your surgical site as well is what they call an Essex retainer. It's basically like an Invisalign uh, retainer, but you just take some composite and put the patient's tooth inside there. So it's aesthetically acceptable. The patient can choose to wear it. And the nice thing about it is it can sort of help in the development of a nice pontic site as well. So you can see this uh, this uh, flipper that has been provided to the patient and that is basically it. So post-operative checklist. So post-operatively what you want to basically do is ensure there's a number of things that have been addressed for the patient. So you want to ensure that the transitional prosthesis has been placed appropriately for the patient. You also want to ensure that post-operative instructions have been provided to the patient in the form of care of the surgical site in terms of the oral hygiene and rinses that are going to be required. That post-operative medications have been provided to the patient. So we place an immediate implant here. So when I'm talking about post-op medications, we're talking about things like analgesics and antibiotics. Uh, number four, you want to ensure that the appropriate post-operative follow-up appointments have been scheduled. So in this patient, we're, we're going to bring this patient back at seven days just to take a look at our surgical sites. And we're also going to bring the patient back usually in about anywhere from three to four months to do the stage two procedure. And this all depends upon the initial 
uh, torque that the implant had gone into and also don't forget the lateral stability that had been provided so given the uh, jump gap junction that did exist the, we're going to we're going to intuitively assume that the lateral stability on this implant was not the greatest and we're going to have to give this a little bit more healing time and finally number five ensuring that the patient is fit for discharge with a responsible adult escort so I've included some references that we used in the production of this case presentation and on behalf of the entire dental treatment team at the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Center Institute, I'd like to thank you for listening to our case presentation.